Um, well, good uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And um, <clears throat> so I press this. No? Yeah, there we go. Uh, I thought that because we're uh, at the Lyle meeting that I should uh, show something that has something to do with, uh, with uh, Lyle. And so this is an il illustration from one of his books, uh, The Elements of Georgi from 1838. And I was baffled to see that the, uh, sorry, I'm shaking, uh, this uh, uh, profile of uh, his volcano here, it looks exactly like this one by Turner from 1819, the Mount Vesuvius uh, in eruption. So I think probably Lyra was uh, inspired by this um, that for the title under the volcano. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, Charles Lyell, he was born in 1797, and uh, in 1858, when he was uh, 60, 61, <laughs> he, he uh, did a trip to Etna and um, used a mule to get up the mountain and down again. And he wrote to his wife, and this was, he, he managed to prove that Etna was built up by several eruptions and not just one cataclysmic one. He wrote to his wife that a good mule is like presenting an old geologist with a new pair of legs. So, yeah, that's a good thing. And I thought that was funny because uh, this little fe fellow here was born at the local riding school in my town uh, after they had bought a new pony and they didn't realize that she was actually expecting something. And so they, when they realized that, they thought, oh, there will just be a a normal foal coming out, but instead this guy came out and it turns <laughs> out that the, the pony had, uh, had company by a, a, a donkey in, a, in the pasture where it had gone. So that was, <laughs> things are strange. But in 2016, we did a field trip to Morocco to study uh, the camp and the sediments that are interlayered and underneath. And somewhere, some 50 kilometers south of Warsasat, uh, we got a flat tire. And uh, you can see that it's basically nothing around here. And uh, <clears throat> luckily, we did have a spare wheel. So I would say that that is just as well as having a, a, a mule, right? <laughs> uh, and we were on our way to sample this, which was uh, the foam squid, squid dike, which is a really long dike uh, from the camp that um, uh, is very beautiful, and by the way, has some very nice hotels at the base. So, <clears throat> and the foam skid up here has now been dated to 201.111 plus minus uh, a little bit uh, million years by Davis et al. And here's the camp, and you've heard a lot about it today, and it covers a really large area, actually all the way down from Bolivia and up to uh, Bretagne. And uh, you can see on this uh, map all the uh, localities where intrusions or, or uh, basalts have been um, dated. And it's uh, primarily these three papers that have provided some really high resolution uh, uranium lead ages for the camp. And this is really good for us who are not volcanologists <laughs> like me, because I'm a palynologist and a biostratigrapher, because now we can correlate the camp better with our sedimentary successions. And uh, you know, the end Triassic uh, extinction, uh, mass extinction, it occurred slightly before the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. And the Triassic-Jurassic boundary has been estimated to around 201.36 million years. And uh, <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is defined by the first occurrence of this uh, ammonoid, Silocera spele, and this is the GSSP uh, section, Kujok, in uh, Austria. And uh, what we can see happens here at the GSSP section is that we have multiple uh, organic carbon isotope excursions. <laughs> And we have Spela here, and down here we have the last Triassic ammonoid, Corystoceras marshi. And uh, the disappearance of Corystoceras marshi is what sort of 
marks the onset of the extinction. And uh, it goes on, the extinction goes on for this interval here. And uh, in that interval, we have a proliferation of spores, this spore here, called uh, polypodisporitis, polymicrophoratus. And I'm not going to bore you with this name, so I'm just going to refer to this green interval in other uh, pictures so that you will see. Um, and this uh, turns out to be rather important, at least for stratigraphic reasons, within Northwest Europe. So for a biostratigrapher as myself, timing is uh, everything when it comes to understanding what is going on at extinction intervals. And uh, if I don't know what's going on and what events come in in which order, then I'm sort of lost in time and lost in space as well. And then you cannot move or prefer, perform any actions. And that's basically how I felt for a long time. Because here's Kujok, and there's the green interval. And this is St. Audrey's Bay in the UK, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with now after hearing it several talks. And if we look at the green interval here, it comes in after this very negative peak, which coincides with the last occurrence of Choristosaurus <coughs> Martian. But in the UK, it, the green interval is before this very negative peak here. And I was working on this section in the Danish basin, where we also have this green interval before the peak, just as in St. Audrey's Bay. So this left me completely confused. So, and I think the diagnosis is stratigraphic confusion. Okay, but what we did is that we built up this stratigraphic framework consisting of uh, events of ammonoids, spores and pollen, dinoflagellate cysts, which are marine, and uh, uh, spores and pollen are terrestrial, of course. And then we used all these radiometric ages from the camp that were available at the time. Uh, and this was before some of the papers that came out last year and this year. Um, and we used the uranium lead dates from ash beds in successions where they also have the ammonoids. And this was all very well. So we published that paper. And this is the correlation over uh, North uh, West Europe with uh, all these various sections with carbon isotopes and all the various events. You can see this green interval here is sort of baselined at the base of the green interval. You can do that a little bit any way you want, but um, it always ends up between the last uh, occurrence of Choristosaurus marshi and the first occurrence of, of Psilocerus spela. It always ends up between where you have normal Retian flores and uh, normal uh, Jurassic flores. So we think that this is a fairly confident marker for at least within Northwest Europe. And on this picture, the green interval more or less corresponds to parts of this white interval here. And this is how we correlated it with the uranium lead ages of the camp basalts, which are the brown ones over here. And the yellow ones are uranium lead ages of ash beds from uh, sections that contain the ammonites. And then we, could, we made this sort of very schematic graph of what the carbon isotope curve looks like across the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. So this is all very well, and, but now we would like to take it a step further, and we want to know, can this help us to understand the end Triassic extinction better? And first of all, I'd like to say that the camp is very, very special, I think, because uh, people are arguing, was it a plume or was it not a plume? Um, the Tron, Torswick uh, and Cox in 2013, they suggested that the plume head impinged somewhere <coughs> below Florida and that it was generated from this large low shear velocity province, the LLSVP, the African LLSVP, which at that time would lie here. You can see the red dot. And these are all these, I've just transferred them to this map and tried to find the right location. It's not always easy, but I tried to do it. Uh, and so it doesn't really look like they're all coming from, from one spot. And it looks even worse if you, if you think that you can divide them into phases. So you've got one here, 
And this is all from connecting all the, the chart that we did in Lindstrom et al. with what Davies et al. had in their paper and Heimdall et al. now in 2018. Uh, so there's one face down here, and then there's one here around where Chorostoceras marshy is, and then there's one face up here where Celoceras spelae comes in, and then there's a later face up here. So that's four pulses. You can see this is the first one, so you've got all these arrows. This is where things are going on, and this is where things are going on in the second phase around the spele, sort of all over the place, both south and north of the equator. And this is what I think makes camp very special, because you've got this huge volcanic activity going on on both hemispheres. And this is later when it's sort of contracted a little bit. Um, so what do we know what goes on when we do have uh, large-scale volcanism? Well, we know, we know very little. From, but we have some historic accounts, like from the Laki event in uh, 1783. Laki was a volcano in Iceland that erupted. And some of these um, accounts are really nice. It's like uh, you know, people telling that they could hardly see the sun because it was such hazy skies. And the trees, they just withered. And vegetables <coughs> died. And fruits fell off. And leaves fell off. And everything was really chaotic. And this was because... The Laki that went on for about seven months actually emitted a lot of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. And that was spread all over the uh, northern hemisphere. And it actually caused a cooling for 10 months, or 10 years, sorry, after uh, the event. And right at the event, the emissions from, from this Laki event also caused a huge um, rise in summer temperature. So it was really, really hot that summer. Um, and I think that is a really good analogy that we have to keep in mind when we talk about the camp, of what we can expect that would come out of uh, the camp volcanism. Now, one of the most uh, discussed things that would come out is, of course, uh, carbon-12 that would explain all these negative peaks that we see at, uh, in the carbon isotope curve. And yes, I made a composite carbon isotope curve here by combining three records. It's our own record, Sten Lille. It's uh, the record from St. Orders Bay, and it's the one from Kujok. And I based it on our correlation, so it's not the same as some other people have showed before. And um, I've only tweaked it a little bit. There's a hiatus, a small hiatus in Kujok, and I, I just put that in and just uh, moved a little bit of a section down here to... So, yeah, call me crazy, but I did it. Anyway, so what we can see is the negative CIEs, they seem to correlate really well with the known extrusives that we have, the known basalts that are dated. Only you need to bear in mind that all these basalts down here and this one here, they are the same. They are just showing different dates. Um, but still, there's a fairly good uh, correlation between the basalts and the negative carbon isotope peaks. Now, there have been some studies on how much uh, uh, carbon dioxide did this uh, increase in the atmosphere. And uh, one study is from Schaller et al. from uh, <clears throat> 2012. This one here that shows that is from soil carbonate in uh, the New York basin. And this one is a uh, stomatal proxy from uh, Steinthorstotter et al. in uh, 2011 from Greenland. And as you can see, they don't really look the same, but they don't really cover exactly the same interval either. You can see here that there's a big shift across this interval where the last uh, ammonoids are uh, disappearing. Um, so there's a big shift. We get a huge increase in carbon dioxide here. And then it sort of continues. But there are only a few points here, so we don't really know what the resolution is. And um, maybe the Greenland record has a little better resolution across the boundary and actually shows an additional increase in carbon dioxide across that level. Um, we heard talks earlier about mercury, and I'm going to show you some mercury anal analysis too. And there are two records here that are uh, so far unpublished. I hope they will be published really soon. And I've used uh, one of uh, Lawrence uh, 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 sections and uh, 
the one from Kuchok. And then I've, uh, I've also used one from Thibodeau et al. And uh, it looks like this. So these are uh, mercury to TOC to account for not uh, if you don't have that much TOC or you have much TOC, it doesn't really matter. And so this is our succession, Stin Lille, and this is Rödby in the North German Basin. And this is Kujok from uh, Lawrence's work, and this is from Thibodeau et al. in uh, the New York Canyon. And what we can basically see is that uh, there might be a, something going on down here. We don't really know because not many people work with, uh, with that level. Uh, then there's uh, an interesting level here where there's around the Corystosaras marshy where there seem to be a lot of mercury coming in. And then there's more mercury coming in up here around the Spele uh, level and higher up around this level here, uh, <coughs> there's an additional amount. So there seems to be at least uh, three or four pulses uh, across this, and it fits really well with the carbon isotope uh, curve too. Now, if we look at uh, at the biota, uh, there's a big question: Is what went wrong first? Did things go wrong first on land, or did they go wrong first at sea? And can we see this in any way? And this is a very schematic uh, uh, figure, so it's not meant to be like the total truth or anything like that. This is actually from uh, Lindstrom uh, et al. in 2012, I think. And this shows, uh, in the green box, it shows the general panology of the still Lille succession. And you can see that there's a huge uh, change going on in this interval, which <laughs> corresponds to that green interval that we were talking about earlier. And that ends up here between these, between the last occurrence of the Triassic ammonoids and before the first occurrence of the Jurassic ammonoids. So basically, the extinction interval. And you can see then that there are things going on here. And I'm especially interested in this one here, the, di the Triassic dinoflagellate cysts. So I think this interval here, which coincides with this massive rise in carbon dioxide, is also underrepresented uh, in studies. So one thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, Dinoflagellate cysts are primary producers, so what happens to them uh, affects the entire food chain in the ocean. And uh, these are uh, two different uh, Triassic dinoflagellate cyst families. And uh, uh, this is how many there were of uh, this group during the late Triassic. And basically all of them except two uh, went extinct at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary or during the end Triassic uh, extinction event or earlier. And in this family, uh, this one went extinct, but this one continued. And uh, <clears throat> why is this? Well, there's actually been a really good recent study on extant dinoflagellate cysts where they found that they found dinoflagellate cysts in sediment that were 100 years old, and they could revive them. Because dinoflagellate cysts, they form these that's why we call them cysts. The dinoflagellates, they form these cysts where they can hide if things go wrong in the environment. And then when things get better, they can come out and they can sexually reproduce, uh, which you can see here. So 100 years old, that means that they could actually, you know, stand out. Uh, just say, okay, this is not good for me. I'm just going to rest here for a while. And that means that maybe they could continue for longer than the others. But it doesn't really uh, explain why some died out and others didn't. And this is something that we need to look into more. OK, so on land, there were multiple stressors uh, that we can see also in the, we can see that uh, there were wildfires going on. We can see that from charcoal records uh, at these levels here. And uh, in uh, Greenland, you can see it here. And in Greenland, they also have this really nice uh, new study by uh, Steinthorstotter et al. On, uh, on sulfur dioxide damage on leaves across this interval, saying something that, okay, the volcanism that was going on at that time <coughs> uh, emitted a lot of sulfur dioxide. And then we have something called biomarkers, the PAH, which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are carcinogenic and not good for the environment at all. And, and uh, these have been found at different levels uh, during this interval. But especially these ones in Marienthal have been linked to or can 
be linked to intrusions of um, volcanics into organic rich sediments. And if we look at uh, <coughs> uh, these, uh, we can see that they coincide with these dates over here, more or less, which are these Brazilian ones. And in Brazil, we have a lot of uh, sills, camp sills, intruding into lower Paleozoic organic rich rocks. So it's very interesting. Yeah, so I haven't told you about a lot of these things. I'm actually done now. Uh, and um, there's a lot of things that other people will tell you about. Uh, um, Karen Bacon will tell you a little bit more about the sulfur dioxide. But uh, one thing that I want to say is that camp had a tactical warfare. And it went on with, you know, you attack from all flanks, south of the equator, north of the equator, at the equator. You use every available chemical weapon that you have, and you attack repeatedly. Thanks for listening.